Uh, so, uh, everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Uh, so, now we have just a couple of minutes and then we will make a break. Uh, so, Uh, so, uh, is it clear now, or are there any other questions about about this stuff? About how we find the probability for a particular for a particular data point? I have a question. Okay. So, we have to look whether we are on the left hand side of the graph or on the right hand side of the, of the graph. And we, if we are on the right hand side, the Corresponds to value one for uh, for epsilon for for y, and so we have to. It's uh, it's where in that case it's mm -hmm. it corresponds to x two and y two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What we did with x two and y two, right? Uh, well, we uh, we look at the very uh, 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 we look at the value of y uh, at a particular data point. For example, for this data point, the value of y is one. We see it uh, because the corresponding uh, vertical coordinate is one. And uh, then we understand that uh, the probability to get this point equals to the value of our function p at uh, the corresponding x. So this value O dot nine. And for example, for this point, uh, we see that this point corresponds to the value y equals to zero because we are on the horizontal line. Uh, and uh, it means that the probability to get this data point is the same as the probability to get a value of y that equals to zero uh, for this value of x. So we have to find this value. This value is probability to get one in this case, this is O.95. Uh, and then we use uh, this value to find probability to get zero because uh, we can uh, get only uh, zero or one as the values of uh, our variable. Uh, then uh, these two probabilities uh, have to be, uh, uh, the sum of these two probabilities have to be equal to one. So uh, we, we just subtract this value from one in this case. So. Uh, which value to choose, p of x or 1 minus p of x, uh, depend uh, on the corresponding value of y uh, in the particular data point. Okay, thanks. So uh, another question, is, that, is it then accurate to say that the steeper the graph, the more accurate, or the values that are of x that are close to zero? Okay. Uh, yes, it, it, well, actually, it actually depends. Look. Uh, it is possible to have different, uh, different. Yes, yes, you are correct. If uh, if we have, um, uh, uh, for example, if we have only two points, assume that we have only two data points in our data set, like uh, one one point here and another point here. Uh, this is one. This is zero. And uh, in this case. Uh, if we want to uh, get, uh, for example, probability to uh, get all points, both points, uh, we want to get them both close to one, uh, then uh, we have to consider uh, as much steep uh, curve as possible. So we have to consider like, like a curve that is almost zero here, then we have a very sharp step, and then we have almost one here. This is correct, uh, but yes, yes, this is correct. Mm -hmm. So, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, now the 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 final step uh, is that we just want. Uh, now we discussed probability of some particular particular points. For example, this point, 
or this point or this point or this point. Now uh, we want a probability to get the whole data set that we have. Uh, in this case, we assume that these points are obtained uh, by some independent sampling. And uh, probability to get uh, this point uh, and this point is just a product of these corresponding probabilities. So, uh, we have the following uh, function, which is called likelihood. Uh, likelihood function. Uh, it is uh, a probability uh, to get uh, the whole data set and it is calculated as a product of probabilities of particular points. Uh, now, uh, when we have our data set and we fixed some particular values of uh, beta naught and beta one, so we fixed some particular curve, uh, then uh, we can use this curve and the corresponding, uh, the corresponding function P of X uh, to find uh, this likelihood, to find a uh, probability to get our data set. For fixed beta naught and beta one, it is just a number. So you can just find it, just like we uh, did it previously. And uh, then uh, you say, okay, we have, we have a function that depends on two variables, on beta naught and beta one. And we want to find uh, the values of beta naught and beta one, uh, such that this likelihood is as large as possible. So, uh, model fitting is the following. Uh, find such beta naught and beta one uh, that give maximum likelihood. for our data. Uh, let me show you an example. And I think this will be the last thing that we will discuss today. Uh, assume that my logistic curve for some fixed values uh, of beta naught and beta one uh, is uh, this one. So uh, this is X and this is Y. Uh, my question is, uh, is, it, uh, is it optimal curve? Uh, can we, uh, can we change uh, values uh, of beta naught and beta one? So can we can we change this curve in, in some way, for example, by shifting or by horizontal rescaling uh, to increase likelihood? Are there any ideas how to increase likelihood? How can we, uh, we should shift, uh, shift it to the right. Yes, yeah, exactly. Uh, because uh, 
for example, uh, let us consider, uh, for example, let us consider uh, this point. Uh, likelihood of this point under this model is very low because uh, our model suggests that for this kind, uh, that for this value of x, uh, we should get uh, one with probability that is close to one. Uh, but uh, we see that we can increase uh, this likelihood just by shifting this curve to the right. We can consider another curve like this one, uh, for which uh, for which likelihood uh, of uh, these points increase. Uh, of these points and likelihood of uh, other point uh, more or less will not change. It can change slightly, uh, but uh, anyway, likelihood here uh, is increased uh, very, uh, uh, this increase is rather large. And uh, this change uh, here and here, uh, we do not have uh, any significant change in the corresponding likelihood. So when you do our optimization, we will use uh, this curve, we will prefer this new curve uh, to the previous one because it is more likely to get our data uh, from uh, this new model or for, for, for these new parameters of this model. Um, is this idea clear? So basically, uh, basically we have uh, a kind of fitting of our curve to our data using this maximum likelihood maximization, uh, maximum uh, likelihood procedure. We try to, to 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 find this curve such that likelihood of all points is as large as possible. Now, of course, for individual points, uh, we cannot achieve it. Uh, for example, uh, for this point the corresponding likelihood is very small. But, uh, okay, uh, it can happen. We are interested in the overall likelihood of this data set. That is calculated as product of likelihoods. Okay. Can I make a question? Yes, sure. Is there a way to calculate this optimality like in more complex, for more complex data sets? Uh, actually, uh, if you have not, uh, not just two variables, uh, you have, uh, for example, if you have more than one variable as X, uh, everything is the same. All the calculations are the same. Uh, the only problem is that it is, uh, it is difficult to draw pictures. But uh, you do basically the same thing. Uh, you just uh, let me uh, let me return to to my initial formula. Uh, you can just here instead of uh, considering this linear function, you can consider a linear function that takes into account all independent variables that you have, and uh, then uh, everything everything just goes in the same way as previously. You find a uh, likelihood of your data and uh, you maximize this likelihood uh, by choosing uh, appropriate coefficients for all uh, values uh, uh, for all coefficients in this right hand side. Uh, it is also possible to have not binary outcome here but more complex thing. For example, it is possible that you have not uh, two categories uh, but three categories or more. Uh, then you can use uh, more complex things like multinomial regression. Uh, that is uh, another topic. Uh, I'm not going in, in, to discuss it now. Other questions? Okay, uh, then uh, I think that we can make a 10 minutes break.
Uh, uh, actually, I will just keep this, uh, this uh, meeting open because uh, I just uh, bought a commercial version of Zoom, so it will not uh, stop us. Um, uh, and I think we will continue in this uh, in, in the in the same meeting. So, ten minutes break.
Добрый день. Добрый день. Отлично, хорошо. А видите ли вы экран?
Okay, uh, so let's start. Uh, okay, uh, well, um, we are doing the lab uh, on logistic regression now. Uh, it is lab nine. Uh, so please uh, download this file and we can uh, go through the all the topics here. Uh, first, we have to uh, install um, all the libraries we need. Uh, first of all, these are tidyverse. Uh, and then we will use the library stats for the GLM function. And this is the main function we will do today uh, with the binary logistic regression. Okay, so uh, then we need uh, the library caret to calculate confusion matrix and um, agreement of our models. And well, um, in the very end of the lab, we will try to apply the library P rock to um, calculate uh, and plot the rock curves. Okay, I think that everybody downloaded the, the file and we can start with the first um, uh, uh, assignment. Okay, uh, first of all, we'll uh, take uh, the uh, data set we are very well familiar with. Uh, so it is uh, data from the phonological database LabSeed. And we will be interested in uh, uh, whether the languages with more consonants are more likely to have adjective sounds. So this is also the mm, task we are familiar with. But today we'll try to see uh, uh, how the GLM model um, can fit our data. Yes, first we will... Um, uh, load the data and just plot uh, our uh, graph with the number of consonants and uh, the presence of adjectives. Just remember that uh, adjectives is a kind of uh, sounds like ah. So, um, some languages do and some languages like uh, Russian don't them. Well, and now we see uh, two groups of uh, languages uh, grouped by the uh, variable, the presence of adjectives. And as you see, um, I use the geom jitter function here uh, with the attribute width equals uh, 0.2. And this means that all these points that you see here, I, they are just jittered around the uh, line no and the line two. So actually we have two variables on the X axis, no and yes. So these are just two uh, lines and we just jitterate the points here to make them more visible. Okay, and now we can model um, our data and let us um, fit the model that uh, well classifies our languages uh, by the number of consonants. And the dependent variable is uh, adjectives mainly yes or no. So in uh, the uh, uh, exercise 1.2, uh, 
Well, I see the model uh, just without predictors. First of all, we, this is our baseline model. And just uh, let us look how it uh, looks like. Uh, the first of all, I put adjectives versus one. This means that there is only uh, the um, intercity in my model and no predictors. And I also put uh, the uh, attribute family equals binomial. Uh, so this means that my GLM model, which is the general uh, model, uh, will uh, use the uh, family of functions for binary logistic regressions. And let's look at the summary of my model. Well, now I see that my interseat has, uh, yes, has the um, uh, equals uh, minus 0.53 and so on. And let, let's predict uh, something with our model. So uh, first of all, I will um, get the estimate. And uh, well, first, I will just uh, look at my uh, data, uh, mainly uh, what uh, the adjectives is. And then I will uh, apply log to see what is a 10 divided by uh, 17. Okay, now, uh, well, to interpret this model uh, in which we don't have any predictors and uh, well, we take some language. So for any language about we don't know anything, we have just an estimate uh, the probability of the language to have adjectives. So I just uh, apply the same formula you discussed during the uh, lection. And well, I will use exp function to uh, well calculate the exponent from my model. Yeah, just remember that the log on 10 divided by 17 was minus 0.5. And now I apply this uh, formula and uh, well, get 0.37. So this is the probability of the language to have adjectives. Okay, but now we will fit um, the second model with numeric predictor. So actually we have the number of consonants in my data set and I will predict whether the language has adjectives or no uh, taking these uh, uh, data. Yeah, great. Uh, so I will fit the second uh, model, fit two. Uh, and here you see, I just use um, n con um after tilde as the only numeric predictor of my model. So let me run this uh, model and look at the summary. Okay, uh, now it gets more interesting and we see that, uh, well, uh, we have an adjacent 
with an estimate minus 9.9204. And we have the number of consonants as well, yet significant uh, predictor. Yeah, we see that the probability, uh, the significance, uh, the p-value for this variable is 00111. Yeah, and uh, the coefficient is 0 0.3797. Okay, so let us look at the coefficients and, well, see the formula. So the formula for our logit model is that the log for odds of adjectives equals beta zero, which is our intercept, and then beta one uh, by the number of consonants and uh, in lapsit. So here you see the two coefficients in our model, beta zero and beta one. And let us uh, do uh, visualization. Well, because it's very uh, useful to see how our model works. So at the plot with the sigmoid line, we see our data points. So on the uh, axis y with uh, y equals zero, uh, we see some points uh, that ranges from uh, about 5 to 30, 30. yeah? So th this is the number of consonants for languages the model believes to be, uh, to be, uh, to don't have adjectives. And if we look at the um, y equals 1, we see um, another um, another points which we know to be the languages with adjectives and our sigmoid can be used to um, see whether the we well actually we believe that um, the languages are classified with certain probability um, as having or not having adjectives so let us look at the language that have exactly 30 consonants. And we see that the probability of this language is, well, this is line 72. Uh, and you see that the probability is 1.47 um, and then we divide it by 1 plus 1.47 and this probability is 0.813 and so on and so forth. So I can look at my uh, sigmoid above and well, actually, I see that my sigmoid at this level uh, for the number of consonant equals 30, it will be, yeah, exactly 08, something like this. And now the next step is to uh, use our model 
to um, predict some languages, uh, some points with the known number of consonants. So now I am at the line uh, 74, and I will use predict to, oh, well, um, to see the model. Okay, so I will create a new data frame with uh, four points. Uh, the number of lapsid equals 30, 55, 34, and 10. Well, and I will try to predict um, my model. First let, uh, first, let us predict uh, the odds. Yeah, and we'll see that the odds are like this, 170, uh, 47. This is what we done before, and then uh, 11, and then three, and then roughly minus six. Yeah, and if I want to get uh, the probabilities of my languages to be uh, the language with adjectives, well, I <coughs> uh, can put uh, the attribute type equals response. And I can also add um, the um, confidence intervals in order to make sure that, well, I know, um, uh, uh, I'm sure that, well, my uh, language is classified to this or that group. And I see that, uh, yeah, the, all the languages, well, can be, um, actually have, well, very nice confident intervals. And now I can create a plot with confidence intervals to see how my uh, classifier works. So now I'm at uh, line uh, 40, oh, 84, sorry. And well, uh, I just add the fit variable and the uh, confidence intervals uh, to my data set. And you can see two new columns in my data set. And yeah, and now adjectives is uh, what we observed in our data set. So let look at the visualization. Again, we have the same uh, plot for the model. Okay, I switched off the sound. Um, but uh, if you want to, well, talk to me, you can just unmute your mics. Well, but uh, please feel free to, uh, yeah, to uh, write something in our chat. So sorry, these are actually uh, the master students from another group. They are very active. Okay, great. Uh, so now we can see the plot for the model. And here we see the confidence intervals. Visualize, uh, visualize, visualize it. Yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, actually we see that for some languages, we can be so sure that these, they are either uh, languages with adjectives or not. For example, if my well language uh, has about 27, 25 to 27 consonants, 
you can see that the confidence intervals is, well, uh, it crosses the line with P equals 0 0.5. And by default, in the binary model, 0 0.5 is a kind of division rule, yeah? Okay, if you have any question, you can ask me now. And after that, we will um, go to the second topic, to the logistic model with the um, categorical uh, predictors. Great, so now uh, we will take a um, pretty new data set for you. Uh, it is about the choice between two constructions in Russian. Actually, I think that we uh, discussed a bit this uh, kind of question during our very first le uh, le uh, lecture, but well, let us just look at the data. So uh, now we'll discuss uh, the so-called locative alternation in which is actually um, uh, a kind of linguistic phenomenon, uh, very well known in many languages, um, English, Russian, uh, German, and others. Well, and let us uh, take the Russian verb grusit as an example of these two constructions. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, the Russian verb gruzit, uh, or in Russian gruzit, uh, well, can, to, uh, can have two govern patterns or two syntactic constructions it can appear in. Well, uh, the first one we will call them gruzit машину ящиками or to uh, load uh, the car with, say, some boxes. Uh, if, uh, well, I translate it uh, into English. And the second one is to gruzit or yashiki uh, v to load the boxes, uh, for example, in the car or on the mm, track or uh, whatever you want. So these two constructions uh, actually, uh, well, differ in um, what uh, will be used as the uh, direct object in this construction. In the first case, uh, the uh, car will be the object. And in the second case, uh, the boxes will, will be the object. So from the point of view of the construction grammar theory, we uh, well have two ways to construe our well external world to conceptualize it. 
Well, but uh, let us um, uh, well uh, take and look at uh, at another um, variables in uh, our model. Well, what do we have here? So uh, the first predictor, uh, the independent variable, uh, has uh, four values, and it is called verb. So actually, um, if we use uh, the verb without prefix, gruzić, or just load, uh, we just, uh, well, um, mark it as, it as zero. And then we have um, uh, three more, um, uh, three, three more uh, actually, uh, well, levels uh, in this factor. Na, za, i po. And these are prefixes that can be used with this verb. So actually, verb is a kind of, well, lexeme that is used in this construction. And we believe that, well, some prefixes uh, can be used as predictors uh, to predict whether the construction will be either theme or goal. Uh, theme means that the um, boxes uh, will be used as uh, the uh, direct object of this construction and goal that they will be used as uh, a prepositional, um, mm, uh, prepositional uh, group uh, with the goal meaning. Okay, the next predictor uh, is called reduced and this is an um, also a variable with just two values, yes and no. Well, here we uh, refer to whether the construction uh, has only one uh, object in it, then it is not reduced, no, or it uh, has a full pattern with both uh, uh, direct object and another participants. And the last one is participle. And here we uh, believe that, well, uh, in our case, uh, verbs uh, which are used as participles, such as gruzhony, nagruzhony, pogruzhony, and so on and so forth, uh, yeah, will uh, work uh, well, will actually probably differ from uh, other verbs. So participle with two values, yes and no, also, well, a great um, predictor. At least I believe uh, at this point. Okay, and now, well, um, I will load this um, data and look at the summary first. Okay, so I see that we have, well, pretty many um, observation points in our model. We have uh, 80, 71 goal constructions and more than 1,000 theme constructions. And we have um, also, well, an, even distribution of the verb predictors, reduced and possible. And the um, idea to uh, collect this uh, data set was just to use a random sample from the Russian national corpus. So now we see that the verb gruzit is uh, used more in theme, in the theme construction, than in the goal construction. So that, that is what happens here. Okay, and now this is my question, how you will formulate your hypothesis? Just take two minutes to formulate it. Of, care, of course, you have to uh, include uh, 
predictors that you believe to work with as predictors in our model? Yes, and there can be two ways of reasoning. The first one, well, I will uh, think that, well, my four or variables are just associated. Uh, well, but I don't know whether we, uh, uh, the verb and reduced and participle variables will work as predictors. <clears throat> but in my case, I think that the choice of constructions actually depends on the choice of verb reduced and participle values. Yeah, an important thing here is uh, all my variables in my data set are categorical. So we just uh, use categories to uh, run the model. Okay, so now I will fit uh, the simplest logistic regression using only verb as the only factor. So uh, in this case, my hypo hypothesis can be formulated as that the choice of constructions depends on the choice of the verb in the language. And now I need, um, well, uh, some of you to unmute your mics and actually formulate the results of your analysis. О, я слышу кого-то. Угу. So, uh, could you formulate the results? What can you see from the model?
Well, I can hear some noises, but um, can't hear you. Speak up, please. Will this model be a linear regression? Yes. Uh, no, this is a classification model. Yeah, mm -hmm. because we are working with the uh, log logistic regression models. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, well, I. Well, think it will show us the dependency of. Uh, uh, the variable uh, because of uh, the verb, if there if there is any bracket, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So well, um, could uh, can you see the summary of the model? You can either do it yourself or just look at my shared screen. First of all, the first question: whether the variable verb is a significant predictor in my model. What can you say here? Well, okay, Lisa says no, but put three asterisks. Lisa, could you explain your uh, answer? I mean, Lisa Nosova. Uh, okay, Lisa uh, says that well, she can't uh, speak uh, because she do uh, she doesn't have mic in her Zoom. Okay. Okay. Uh, other um, answers. Я думаю, что я могу объяснить, потому что там внизу где here we can see the significance codes, and there is a, a zero that have uh, three that has three asterisks. And uh, we see it uh, in the table near uh, the result of the column PR more than uh, that. Uh, and uh, uh, so this is the significance that is close to zero, yes? Yeah, great. Yeah, so we can see that both uh, all three um, non-reference level in our models well, uh, just let me uh, go back to the summary of my data set. Yeah, and you can see that we have uh, four factors, uh, four levels in our verb uh, variable. So now this model takes uh, zero is a reference level in my factors. So now we will compare the choice of the constructions. Uh, well, and zero will be the reference level. So actually the intercept of our model uh, now can be interpreted as, uh, well, a predictor when we don't have prefixes with our verbs. Yeah. So, and uh, then uh, our model um, fit uh, 
three non-reference level in, uh, in our model. Yeah. So what can we see here? We see that at the all, all, all point uh, all five significance level, yeah, all uh, three um, uh, levels which is verb na and verb po and verb za are significant in our model. Yeah. Um, and we can uh, see certain estimates, but uh, uh, actually can, can, uh, can not uh, well use it just for some, um, yeah, the, these are uh, actually um, uh, the coefficient uh, in, uh, in our model, yeah. So, uh, well, now our model will work the same way as with the um, categorical predictors with the uh, regression model, yeah, uh, with the linear regression model. So we, uh, we have, uh, well, three uh, non-reference uh, groups here, yeah. And well, I will just put them in my model with the coefficients like uh, minus 2.38, 5.32, and minus 1.33. Yeah. Okay, and well, the result of my analysis so far will be that while verb is a significant predictor for the choice of construction. Well, and now we will um, um, add other factors in our model. Well, uh, first let us um, well add uh, the uh, value reduced like this. Well, and uh, see what happens here. I will just use plus to look at what happens here. Mm -hmm. So fit two models will look like this. Okay, um, uh, let's look at the summary of our second model with the uh, two, um, with two uh, predictors, which is verb and reduced. So now we can see that, well, um, 
uh, both verb and reduced are significant uh, at uh, our significance uh, level 005. Yeah. And the p value for the reduced is, uh, well, 000231. Yeah. So an important thing here is to look at the p values. And now we can compare um, two models. Well, I go back to the first model, yeah, and look at the Ike coefficient, uh, which is um, uh, 1313.3. And in the second model with two predictors, the Akaiki information criteria is uh, 1301.5. So how can we interpret this difference? Which uh, model um, feeds better our data set? Yes, the Akaiki information criteria is less uh, in the second case. So we believe that the second model works, um, uh, fits our data better than the first one. Well, and now we can uh, add the, the third predictor, which is the, uh, what was there, the participle. Yeah, and use all three um, all three variables as predictors. So this will be the fit three model. Okay, and again, we see that the uh, all three um, uh, all three variables are significant predictors in our models. Okay, uh, well, sometimes uh, you can see that uh, your p-values and the coefficients in the model change every time you add or remove some variables. So it is very important to check uh, all p-values in order to see whether your model, um, so in some cases some predictors can be uh, significant but can be insignificant if we add other variables. Yeah, well and we look at the Akaiki criterion here and see that uh, it is even smaller than before. Okay, so uh, if you don't have any uh, questions so far, let us go to the uh, model with all factors and all possible interactions. So now I will run uh, the mm, section 2.7. Well, uh, in order to see the interaction, the effect of interaction between uh, my models, well, I will put uh, the multiplying, uh, multiply sign uh, in my model. So now I just replace uh, pluses with 
multiply with uh, uh, signs, yeah. And well, this will be the fit for model. Okay, and let us look at the summary of this uh, model fit, fit for. Uh, and first of all, let us look at the interaction uh, among all three predictors. So here we have uh, verb na interacting with uh, reduced eyes yes and participle yes. Well, we see a lot of insignificant, in, insignificant predictors in uh, our model. And now you can see that even the main predictor, which is verb with the prefix poor, is also insignificant. So we see that, uh, well, our model uh, doesn't fit our data. So nice. Even, even though uh, the Ike uh, criteria is smaller than before, we cannot use this model uh, as we have a lot of insignificant predictors. Okay, uh, so what should we do now? What's your suggestions? Okay, uh, Alexei asks, can we interpret verbs are participle yes? Uh, is that that prefix za in combination with passive active voice reliably predicts construction? Well, actually, no, in this model, no, uh, because we have insignificant predictors. First, we have to remove all insignificant predictors from our model and then rerun our, our, our model. Yeah. So what I do now, I actually will use, uh, well, a partial interaction, yeah? So actually I just add a uh, verb plus reduced plus the participle, yeah? And then I can just add the so-called partial interaction. Well, the partial interaction, I, I mean the interaction between verb and reduced uh, can be, well, 
written like this uh, verb um, and then reduced uh, and then I will take load uh, uh, by participle interaction verb and participle interaction and then I will include verb oh no re sorry reduced uh, by uh, participle interaction so uh, now in my model I just reduced uh, the triple interaction from the model so let me well make it the model fit five and let's look what happens here. Okay, now we see that reduced by participle interaction. Yeah, this means that, well, we change the level from reduced no to reduced yes and from participle no to participle yes. Yeah. And now we uh, add this uh, interaction and we see that it is insignificant. So we will remove this interaction from the model. And the uh, sixth, the sixth model fit, fit sixth will be so reduced and participle. Yeah, I remove it from my models yeah well and now we see that uh, the verb by participle interaction is uh, significant but the verb and reduced interaction is insignificant uh, uh, at all levels of verb And then we have to, well, also to remove this uh, excessive interaction from the model, verb, verb and reduced. So in the seventh uh, fit, sorry, what happened here? Sorry, something gets wrong with my... Sorry, something gets wrong with my screen okay so I um, uh, so now I removed yeah three interactions and put, put only one interaction in my model, which is verb by participle. Okay, uh, so how can we interpret the uh, coefficients in our model now. Well, the minimal optimal model here is that we have uh, three variables, verb, reduced, and participle as significant predictors in the model. And we also have an interaction of verb and participle 
also a significant pre predictor. Well, sometimes you can see that the um, uh, some uh, at some uh, levels of our factors, uh, the um, p, p value is more than 0 0.05. Yeah, as in this case, we have verb na and participle yes interaction. And we see that at this uh, level of factors, uh, well, this interaction is not significant. Still, we have to uh, uh, hold this interaction in the model, because uh, actually, uh, well, in other levels, uh, we see uh, certain significance. We just interpret these that the difference between uh, verb na and verb zero uh, at the level of this interaction was not uh, actually uh, didn't change the uh, probabilities of the model. Yeah. Uh, and now we can, uh, well, um, uh, 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 say that the minimal optimal model, this term was used by Stefan Gries to uh, describe uh, the models. Uh, this means that all uh, main and interaction factors are significant and the Ike is smaller than other models. So now the Ike equals 0. Um, is the smallest in the uh, models that had all significant predictors within them. So the minimal optimal model will be like this. Well, we can uh, also look at the confidence intervals of the estimated coefficients. Well, and uh, well, I will put the name of my model, uh, which is fit, fit seven. Let us look at the data. Yeah, fit seven. Yeah, and it's important to check whether um, the 95% confidence intervals contain, uh, contain zero. Okay, now we see that actually uh, neither of our uh, coefficients uh, cross the zero here. So we uh, can conclude that, well, uh, well, if uh, yeah, our data set well could be sampled in the different, uh, the same way by, but with different uh, points of observations, we can still be sure at the 95% level that our um, coefficients um, doesn't include uh, uh, that are not zero. Okay, and the uh, can plot these coefficients uh, uh, with the confidence intervals. Now I will uh, use two more packages, ggstance and gtools. So 
will take some time. Okay, and this is visualization of how my, well, coefficients work. Well, and we see why the level of interaction between verb na and participle was insignificant. Uh, also, using the um, confidence interval method, we see that this predictor is insignificant. So in some case, well, the coefficient will be zero. Yeah, and that is not, uh, well, uh, a good predictor in our model. And now we will use um, uh, the exp function uh, to well, interpret the coefficients uh, in our model, feed seven. Okay, and I think that uh, I just, well, uh, stop here. And you can also see how to use the stepwise selection of variables. What actually we don't recommend to use it if you have less than say, uh, some hundreds of variables in your models. It's much better to, well, uh, add and remove variables manually. Uh, to make your results more interpretable. Yeah, but you can still use the stepwise selection. And uh, of course, as in the previous um, uh, labs, you can also use the predict function to predict the results of your model. And uh, uh, in the very end of this lab, you can uh, find the way to plot the AUG curves. Well, do you have any questions? You can answer it either in the chat or just unmute your mic, please. Okay, then probably the last comment from this lab. Uh, first of all, remember that uh, actually your uh, levels in your factors, if you use, well, uh, factors as predictors in the logistic uh, regression models, well, they, uh, well, um, actually uh, are, uh, gets them in the alphabetic order. And here we were interested in the difference between the zero verb without prefixes and the effect of using prefixes with the model. 
yeah? So here we can see that it is more probable that if we use, well, say the verb poor, then the, uh, actually the, um, uh, the probability of my construction to be uh, uh, the uh, uh, goal like is higher than before. Yeah, uh, well, and that's why in our data set, we actually put zero with the uh, underscore, just in order that R would uh, use it as a reference level in our model. And each time we add the categorical predictors in our um, regression models, yeah, we just check whether these uh, difference can be linguistically uh, interpretable. Okay, if, we, if you don't have any uh, questions, so thank you all for the lab. And feel free to ask your questions if you have uh, any problem with your uh, well, assignments. Well, I will publish the our homework, uh, ne next homework and the um, deadline for this homework will be next Saturday. Uh, I assume that our next class will be March uh, 28, but well, we'll we, we are still to check with the um, uh, student's office uh, if it is okay with our schedule. Thanks a lot. Bye.